Good afternoon, buenas tardes, and thank you for tuning in today. On behalf of Mitchell Kaplan, Miami Book Fair, and all of us at Books and Books, I welcome you to a virtual afternoon with Megan Hunter to discuss her novel, The Harpy, published by our friends at Grove Press. The Harpy is a darkly suspenseful domestic drama that is part revenge tale, part fairy tale, and examines the fallout from a husband's affair and the conciliatory pact his wife makes with him that he will allow her to hurt him three times. Megan Hunter's first novel, The End We Start From, has been translated into eight languages. It was long listed for the Aspen Words Prize, was a number one Indie Next pick, and won the Forward Review Editor's Choice Award. Her writing has appeared in the White Review, the Times Literary Supplement, Literary Hub, Bomb Magazine, and many other publications. To moderate this afternoon's conversation, we're joined by Christian Rupenian. She's the author of the short story, Cat Person, which was published in The New Yorker and selected by Sheila Hatai for the Best American Non-Required Reading 2018. Her collection of stories, You Know You Want This, was published in 2019 and HBO bought the development rights. She's now at work on a novel. I'll remind you that all of you watching today can order your copy of The Harpy from Books and Books below by pressing the green button at the bottom of the screen. Every purchase you make keeps Books and Books up and running. So we thank you and remember that indie bookstores need your help now more than ever. We'll have time for a Q&A with the audience following the talk, so please post your questions anytime during the broadcast in the Ask a Question button at the bottom of the screen, and we'll get to those right after the talk. But now, without further ado, I'd like to welcome our guests to the stage. Here we go. Hi. Hello. Hi, great to be here. Thanks for having me. Wonderful Hello. to see you. Hi. Hi everybody. Hi, nice to see you, Megan. Hello. Hi, great to see you too. Hi. Um, well, thank you so much for letting me talk about the Harpy with you. I loved this book so much. I'm excited to tell everyone how much and why. Um, but I thought we could kick off first. You wanted to do a short reading, right, to give everyone kind of a taste of, of what we're talking about. So go ahead. That would be great. Uh, wonderful to be here. And thank you so much, Kristen. It's so great to speak to you. OK, so I'm going to read um, from the very beginning of the novel, the opening, um, which is a short, very short prologue. It is the last time. He lies down, a warm night, his shirt pulled up, his head turned away. It is the kind of evening that used to make me want to fly through the sky, the kind that makes you believe it will never get dark. Neighbors are having barbecues. The smell of the meat, sweet and homely, moves across his face. Downstairs, our children are in their beds, dreaming through the hours, their doors closed, the late light blocked by their curtains. We've agreed on a small nick, his upper thigh, a place that will be behind jeans, under shirts, a place of thick flesh, solid bone, almost no hair, a smooth place, waiting. Jake is not squeamish. He is like a man expecting a tattoo, his hair is getting long, curling over the nape of his neck. His eyes are closed, not screwed shut, just closed, like a skillful child pretending to be asleep. They were colleagues, then friends, and at first I suspected nothing. There were long emails, glimpses appearing on his phone, apparitions, the virgin blue of his notification light in the darkness, nights where we couldn't watch TV because she was calling. Nights I went to bed early, enjoyed the whole bed to myself. If I went in there to get something or turn a light off, I heard his voice sounding different, not romantic or gentle, just on show. His outside voice, the one he used with postmen, salesmen, people from work, I thought that was a good sign. I lift the razor up. I have sterilized it carefully, watching YouTube instructions and rested against his skin. I pressed down very gently and then with slightly more force. Jake's skin was one of the first things I noticed when we met. 
It was like the skin of a young boy. He was a young boy, someone milk fed, comfort raised, someone who la wore large, voluminous boxer shorts, who slept silently on his side, who had a blonde head of curls like an angel. Even his eyelashes were curly. Tears used to get caught in them when we argued. On his stomach, his hair was hairless, his skin was hairless and as soft as a woman's. The first time we went to bed, I kissed it. I confronted him once late at night in my pajamas, leaning against the fridge. Do you want to sleep with her? I asked him. I think it's best if we're just really clear about this. He laughed. I wish you'd get to know her, he said. She's, he paused, the silence standing in for dullness advanced age, sour breath. She's married, he said finally. He looked at me almost kindly. We didn't touch. I lift the razor and a fairy tale drop of blood escapes from under the silver. The colors are the brightest I've ever seen. Stark and cartoon-like, white skin and sea blue shirt and dark red rolling and seeking. He doesn't make a sound. <laughs> Whew. Um, that was incredible. Thank you. Um, yeah, I love this book so much. Um, you and I share an, an agent. And mm. when she emailed me the first time and gave me the premise of the book, a man cheats on his wife in an agreement, they say that she can hurt him three times. I don't think I ever hit send faster on an email <laughs> than when I was like, please send that book to me immediately. I must read it. And then when I got it, I read it in one sitting. I mean, it's it's not not short. I mean, it's not a long book, but I just tore through it. And um, yeah, and I, I think, you know, there's the word fairy tale, even in the passage you read, the um, it has been described often as fairy tale like. And I think that's because both it has these kind of magical surreal elements. It has the um, sort of the structure of the threes, which is very um, familiar from fairy tales. But also I feel like there's something deeper than that, which seems to me has something to do with when you hear that set up the premise, it feels like it's always existed. That there's some part of you is like, yeah, of course, when a husband cheats on his wife, she gets to hurt him three times. Like mm -hmm. that is how it is. And should be. So there's just something very like complete about it. And yet, I mean, when you write a book, nothing is complete, nothing is certain. It sort of starts from someplace probably very far away from where it ends up and mm -hmm. sort of necessary, not that necessariness of it and the innateness of it is a is an illusion. So I was wondering mm -hmm. if you could kind of talk about the process of getting from mm -hmm. whatever the first glimmer of an idea or an image or a character was to this sort of very polished, very, very complete seeming book that we have at the end of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well I mean I think interestingly that that scene um that I just read or that little prologue and the well the particular scene that's happening of with you know the razor and they're in the bedroom and the children i i wrote that very very early, early on mm -hmm. and it hasn't really changed so that mm -hmm. was a kind of like a little sort of crystallized you know sort of um jewel in the middle and then the whole thing kind of spread out from that um but i did have the idea for a while about this kind of revenge patterning um and yeah it was kind of like a, almost not a joke <laughs> but something i kind of used to like think about as that would be cool to write about but I and I kind of I kind of tried to write about it and but nothing really worked I wasn't sure if it just seemed a bit too over the top or you know not quite very I mean very different from the from you know what I'd written about before um and it was really in writing that scene that I felt okay yes this could work because yeah for me it's always you know a voice a language a, almost a kind of sentence that I can use and then I think okay yes I can you know, I don't think without, I, it's, I didn't really write, think, for example, in my first book, oh, I'll, I'll write a dystopia before I just had the sentences of the dystopia. Mm -hmm. I don't know, that's not yeah. really, yeah. Don't have, you know, I mean, there, there, there's an idea, but an idea can't, can't really be a reality without, for me, without thinking that it has a, a sort of corresponding sentence mm -hmm. <laughs> that works um, and a rhythm and a sort right. of, you know, um, so I very much that scene was the beginning and then I was I wrote a first draft um, yeah. quite fast, and I think that the that sort of inevitability that you're talking about and the fairy tale kind of patterning it did help 
hugely, you know, now, I look, yeah. now I'm writing a, a different kind of book, I can see actually that was very helpful because it, it has it, you know, an inbuilt structure. Mm -hmm. um, but there were still lots of questions, you know, what were the hurts going to be? Yeah. Um, how was everybody going to react to that? You know, how was how was she going to react? How was he? And as I wrote the draft, that was when basically the harpy emerged. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh -huh. the harpy wasn't so. The, the first thing was the um, three times revenge, and I agree, it does have a kind of um, familiarity. And I, I don't know. I mean, I um, my my son, who's um, well, he's eleven now. He's very passionately into um, Greek Greek mythology, uh -huh. and I think there's something like a little bit, you know, this kind of like. Yeah, very kind of dark revenge right. stories that sound kind of unlikely and yet, you know, inevitable. Um, anyway, so the harpy, as I was writing the, I wrote a lot on my own, as in um, I went away or I kind of spent time completely on my own while I was writing it. And that seemed very important. And during the during the end of kind of one of those periods, the harpy just I was in the library. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, Where all um, the things come to you. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. The beloved library, which now I can't go to. Um, and yeah, the harpy just kind of, I don't want to say anything to, you know, to you like it flew, <laughs> flew through the window. It landed on your shoulder. <laughs> yeah, it spoke to me. But it was it was a kind of sense of um, just, a, yeah, like I, I, an image almost popping into my mind. And then uh, very quickly, a physical sense of what a harpy, oh, I think, you know, I probably Googled. I was like, harpy? <laughs> yeah. you know, and then you see, OK, it's these nails. It's this hunger. It's this mm -hmm. anger. And I was like, wow, that's a lot of those things are already there in the book. I think that right. was the thing that was interesting. Because huh. she was already having these, there was already something about um, the, her nails and yeah. a kind of accidental hurting yeah. moment with her nails and then obviously you know that that just happened to to fit with the harpy and there were there was already stuff about hunger and appetite so yeah mm -hmm. i just felt like it was a natural and then yeah that wasn't even the end of the first draft so that so the harpy very quickly kind of became yeah. central yeah cool well, i have a million follow-up questions i guess one thing i'll just say is that yeah it feels like the reference to greek myths makes a lot of sense and that maybe a different way of saying it other than fairy tales is that it's almost like like a a glimpse into a world with a different morality. Like obviously an incredibly immoral and we get very dark and very messy. And yet you can also kind of believe in a world where that is just right and how things are done. And it makes you sort of, it shakes up the way that I tend to think about like, how do we respond? What is right to do when someone wrongs you? It gives you this kind of glimpse into this much other darker world. And I really loved that. Um, you mentioned a few times about how this is your second book. Um, mm -hmm. And we also talked a little bit about that, about what it's like to move from first book to second book. And so your first book, as you sort of briefly mentioned, is a dystopia, very kind of told in flashes, very dark, I would say, too, but a pretty different book. And mm -hmm. I was wondering if you, while you were writing The Heartbeat, if A, if there was it seems like the, already that there was, like if there was a very different change in process, if it just felt different to be writing mm -hmm. sort of once you were al already a writer. And then two, if you ever thought about, and if you still think about sort of, if there's something like that makes a Megan Hunter book, like if, if <laughs> now that you know that you are a writer, that there will hopefully be more than one, is there a thread that you feel like you know will always connect the books and or that other people will always be expecting from you that you need to sort of give them to sort of have continuity? Or is that not something that ever comes into your mind? <laughs> oh, that definitely comes into yeah. my mind. Um, it's very pertinent because I'm, you know, I'm writing it a third book. Um, but to go back, I guess, to the the first part of your question, which was, uh, it's fallen out of my head now, which was about, um, sure just the process how it shifts between yeah. when you're a first time yeah. writer dating so writer. basically the end we start from was written in a way that i i i don't think is necessarily that common and i think it has a lot to do with the fact that um i wrote it much more in the mode of poetry uh -huh. and as a writer in that in in that phase i was very much kind of caught between actually, what kind of writer am I going to be? Am I going to be a poet? Am I going to write fiction? I didn't I didn't really know at that point. I was writing quite a lot of both. And I think when I wrote the um, the end we start from, you know, it didn't it didn't it wasn't really important to me what which genre it was. But right. I think the mode that I wrote it was much more, I mean, not to say that you don't redraft with poetry, because obviously you do a huge amount, but mm -hmm. 
it's like every single word I felt almost kind of had to be or every little passage or one line kind of had to be more or less pretty much completely there before I would move on. Wow, to yeah. um, and I wrote it quite slowly by necessity because mm -hmm. I mean, far slowly, uh, it's difficult to say, but I, it, it was very short. And I, I only had one day a week at that point. I was work, I had a, a day job and mm -hmm. very small children. So I had a day a week, uh, Friday, and I would yeah. go to the particular cafe and I would sit down and I would write it. Uh -huh. And that was, that was, you know, and, and uh, I don't know, six months or something of that. Um, and so it, it was very different process. And I think it was a kind of strange process to have as your first book and maybe just, just speaks to that kind of cross genre or, mm -hmm. you know, kind of the type of writer I was or, or the, or also how quite, it was quite early for me as well in my writing life, really. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I'd always wanted to be a writer, but I'd done different things and I'd had a couple of children and I kind of, it was only a few years really of being like, right, I'm, right. you know, going to really, this is what I'm doing. Um, and then um, of trying out lots of different things and kind of getting really into writers who, yeah, do um, kind of work across different forms. Um, that was really important to me. So, so yeah, so I, I wrote that book in that way. And then a big question for me with my second book was, yeah. is that going to be, you know, another prose poem right 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 <laughs> in, in the same voice the same style you know and some writers do write in a quite a similar right. way across lots of books and that's uh, but I, I did and I did try that but for me it just didn't feel right I felt like I wanted to do something different so to me I, I kept going on about to everybody it's so different, it's so different. <laughs> I think people were like, mm, it's not, it's not that different, really, you know. But, but um, I definitely had a sense that it was so different, and I wrote it, I think, in a much more, um, perhaps, typical way to write fiction, which is that you know, you write, you write it quite quickly. It doesn't, not every single word has to be perfect, and then you go back and you work on it, you know, right. um, rather than this kind of painstaking um, piecing together. But in terms of a Megan Hunter book, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't think I'm not, I'm not, I don't feel established enough to kind of think really in that way about myself too much without sort of cringing. But I think um, it's interesting because, you know, I've, I have something I've thought about recently is, you know, would I ever write like a really kind of long form book and what would that feel like and how would right. that be different, you know, and right. how, what kind of different sense would that have? And I, I wouldn't ever want to, rule that out um but i think i'm often drawn to forms that are that are very tight that are very uh -huh. concise that are maybe influenced by poetry have things in common with poetry right. i read still a lot of poetry i still feel quite engaged yeah. kind of in that realm um not i mean not not professional i don't really write poetry yeah. well i don't publish poetry i do yeah. write poetry <laughs> i write poetry i write at the moment i write it every single day as part of um how i come to the Page. Wow! So I start off every, to read poetry and then write poetry. Just I find that a good, a good starting off point. But um, yeah, no, I I think it's I think it's I, I love these kind of questions and I love this kind of thinking because I think it's actually it's important to kind of take a step back. And I mean, what about you? Do you do you feel like a sense of this is a Christian Rupenian book? Well, I think what's interesting about that process of moving from person who writes at home by themselves to trying to be a writer is that it's you other people can always see it better than you can, right? Like you're never mm -hmm. going to be the person with the clearest mm -hmm. sense of what your themes are and what you care about. Um, mm -hmm. And I think sometimes the most fun part of sharing your work, I thought this was true even in workshop, where people will be like, you are obsessed with this. And I'm like, oh, I am? I didn't even know. <laughs> I was just writing it. Um, and so I do like that process, but I do feel like too much of it and it's good, you get better by having a certain amount of perspective on yourself and getting that reflected back, but too much can be too much, can be too much, you know, like that then you can sort of get self-conscious and get into your head and sort of be trying to imitate what you did before or, you know, what you think is expected as opposed to what you really want to do. And so I would say for me, I don't know. I think that's a big open question. I do feel like I hear you when you're like, there's something about structure. There's something about like condensed language and emotion that makes a lot of sense um, to me for you. And I would say for me, it's more of a, tone. it's a darkness of tone. Like mm -hmm. it's a sort of mix of like high and low or not high and low, but like, yeah, scary and funny, like a sort of tone that will be, could hopefully be pretty consistent, but in many mm -hmm. different 
kind of shapes and forms and genres. But that, mm -hmm. I mean, we'll see. It's obviously early yet for both of us. So mm -hmm. you will probably write your 900 page epic and I will <laughs> write my like hilarious and frothy rom-com and <laughs> talk everyone. I, I love that idea. Yeah, I really, I, I mean, I, I like, I really like the thought of, you know, I think that's just a, a really ex lovely, expansive thought, you know, particularly when you're when you're at the beginning of your career to think about like, you know, for God willing, my, my eighth book or whatever. Right, right. <laughs> like, that's just a wonderful thought. But yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I was I've been rereading re your work and so struck by that, yeah. by that variety in it. And that, you know, the way that you write realism so crisply and confidently and then you write these you know very fairy tale like or and the com you know the, the meeting of the two um right. and i guess that's what i can see across across well with the harpy and with um your collection uh, very much is that that the everyday and then the right you know and then the fantastical like right. the meet those those meeting points like i was noting even in your realist stories where these very fantastical images come in even if the story mm -hmm. is completely you know, in the known world. Um, yeah. So yeah. yeah. No, that that is well put. I don't know that I would have been able to describe it quite like that, <laughs> but I do, I do aim for that, I think. And also I think another thing that I loved about the heartbeat and I feel like why it felt for me as the person who's obsessively thinking about how a person goes about and writing a novel, because I don't understand the way that you poured what feels like a bunch of really inchoate and personal and messy emotions into a very constrained structure did feel to me like something I want to do and sort of will need to do as I move into like a somewhat more, a bigger space, like a, a broader canvas, feeling how you balance those things of tight constraint and then total kind of mm -hmm. just wild ideas and images. I feel like that, you nailed that in the heartbeat and that oh. is something I'm aiming for. <laughs> That is really cool. We have a couple of questions. I have a million more. I won't give it totally over to the audience because I'm in charge. I get to ask my questions, but we can let them ask one uh, one or two. Shall we look at them? Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, two questions about the um, about the cover, which oh, I think yeah. is always an interesting. So, so yeah, why don't we? Uh, do you have? Did yeah. you have anything to say about the cover? How did um, you see versions? So multiple versions? Yeah. And hold it up again, um, maybe so people can see it. Yes, and I will. Yeah, so here is the cover of the hobby. I mean, it does this funny mirror reverse. Yeah, yeah, yeah but yeah, it's, yeah. Um, and this is the American edition, which is very um, beautiful and has these. Oh, it has these um, like end papers or like this <laughs> uncut pages. Anyway, yeah. I'll stop being a book bookie. Uh -huh. But um, yeah, the cover. So the cover came through to me. Um, was it the first one that I saw? No. I think it was the first thing that I saw. That's and it. I was just like, yes, that's, yes <laughs> yeah. that's the one. So that was my involvement, which, as you can see, is very complex. I right. just, uh, I just yeah. wholeheartedly. And then, you know, there's a process um, that goes on about, you know, whether that will definitely be the cover. Mm -hmm. And I was just really, really hoping, you know, yeah. that that would that that would be. The cover because I think it's absolutely perfect and I should say that it is I was looking it's a painting so if anybody doesn't really? know this is, this is a painting by Amy Judd okay. who is a wonderful artist and it was designed by Lucy Scholes at the Picador art department Picador my UK publisher and they have a wonderful art department so they did the design but yeah it's, it's actually a painting huh. yeah mm. so that's yeah, yeah. I That's should see if one day maybe I can get a print of it. Oh maybe. my gosh, you should email the uh, email <laughs> artist, see if you yeah, guys can do another collaboration. No, it's really cool. Yeah. And it's cool that they went out and found art for it. I feel like that kind of cross genre collaboration is really fun because now you have an artist that you, I assume you didn't know her work before. No, but no, I, uh, yeah, it's I, a meeting I, of I mean, the I, month. Yeah, yeah, sorry. I, I, I think. Um, Something I would say is that I always had a very not that I, I don't take any credit for the cover, but I always yeah. had a very I had a very visual um, sense of the book from the mm -hmm. beginning. In the in I and I emailed my first draft, and this came across as being quite strange, but I emailed my first draft to my editors with like a, a picture on the word document, like the first page That's was just a map of the harpy. It was like a um, more like a classical statue. Uh -huh. 
of a, of a you know a harpy with these huge wings coming down um so yeah i always had this sense of of it i think it i think it yeah it really helps to have that kind of or it helped me a lot to have that i've always been quite interested in that sort of meeting point between image mm -hmm. and, text and uh, just having that I, when i write i'm very um visual maybe yeah. you know it's hard to, it's hard to maybe all writers are but i very much see see the scene kind of mm -hmm. playing out in my mind do you collect other images or even or songs or you said poems do you have a kind of file of things that evoke the feeling for you i know some writers do i actually don't but i've tried to do it occasionally <laughs> um yeah. just to help you get into sort of the mind space and the feeling of the book or is it more I mean, like yours in your head and you're true to them i write um i do use scrivener uh -huh. like i move i move i'm not totally loyal like i move around a little bit mm -hmm. but i do and in scrivener do you use scrivener like i have so tried but it my impulse is to be completely all over the place with my add brain and just like put nothing in order is like I guess enabled or like I don't know I just feel like it's not a good match because it's too similar to have 30 different boards open so I try to lock myself what I haven't said which is even worse is like 20,000 word documents all like draft seven draft two and then yeah. I don't even have an order so I can't find it's a mess I should switch to Scrivener <laughs> anyway I, mean, I, I somehow managed to have like multiple multiple Scrivener documents which I think is getting it so wrong <laughs> it's like Scrivener yeah, one two three but um, but I I think at some point I had like a master document, and I in there I would kind of there's a research tab. Yeah. You know? mm -hmm. so I would just like yeah toss in like images, and so I find that quite useful. And then you can click yeah. on them. I mean, at the time, like when I it, it's only with now that I have somewhere to write, like a a room of one's own. Mm -hmm. This is the first time I've ever had a writing space, mm -hmm. um, which is a shed in the garden that I'm sitting in now, and um. I, before that, I was always on the move, so it wasn't really like I could. I don't know. Like I have friends who have like pin boards and stuff. Right. Like, really like to have one of those now, although I don't, I don't have one. But you know, I'm not. I'm. I don't know. I'm. I'm not really that organized. Um, mm -hmm. or I haven't been. Um, since I was a lot younger. I don't know if it's kids kind of, <laughs> just kind of <laughs> this permanent <laughs> disorder. But um, maybe not. But um, but yeah, I um, I I'm, I feel I'm I'm used to even now. Like I have a I have um. A workspace and I'm always carrying everything around <laughs> uh -huh. between, between here in the house like 10 books at a time like I might need I might need every single yeah. book, you know and backpacks and so it's mad yeah. I think I'm just used to having being very much on the go being mobile being right. cafes and libraries I think when you get established when you get established in a certain routine it's hard to what about you where do you where do you work I mean I guess we're all at home now yes so I work at home but I was I am um, lately I've been working on my couch a lot or in this chair over here um I a thing I have noticed about that is I'll get a space that I'll attach to a particular project like I'll write one story and I have to be in the same seat in the same coffee shop as I'm working on that story and then when I finish it I don't want to sit in that seat anymore um which I think is also maybe even part of it because I've bounced around a lot this year. So I'll start a project in one location and then, you know, be like, well, how am I supposed to work in this different chair? <laughs> I guess I better just start a new novel. <laughs> um, but I do think there is something to be said and I do also do it. I'm less of a like, you know, I don't make playlists. My girlfriend is also a writer. She makes playlists for all her her strips. I don't do that. I don't have like a beautiful research section, but I do have a couple of books that I usually want to have near me to like sort of by osmosis sink into my mind. And I want to have them just kind of stacked and on a shelf, like books that I'm mm -hmm. thinking about or things in the sort of same style um, to feel as though, I don't know, like it's a little bit of armor or like you're building yourself. Yeah, a small house you can carry with you of the things yeah. that you're trying to, to bring into the book. Yeah, I love that idea. I really, yeah. That sort of yeah. talisman. Um, exactly. Yeah, I wrote that essay about and the talismans that you carry around. I've heard a lot of other writers, especially yeah. I think women writers talking about that having almost that, it's like kind of like colleagues. Uh -huh. Yes, exactly. Because you work alone, so you need writer. a, you know. Yeah. So you have your like I have I've thought about making jokes about it before on like social media but anyway I'm bad at social media but you know I kind of oh another day with my friends and it's just <laughs> yeah <laughs> totally. <laughs> Angela Carter 
you know yeah exactly you know, my friends my pals and it's yeah, exactly. yeah. My coworker, my supervisor, Angela Carter would be like, get to work. <laughs> that would be that would be a good setup for me. Um, I want have two. I have a, I mean, I have a million more questions. Actually, one of them that just got sent in. Um, it uh, sort of overlaps. It does. It does overlap with one of the questions I wanted to ask. So I'll ask the way they asked it in the chat first and then um, maybe add to it. So um, so the question is, the demands of motherhood play such a powerful role in both the harpy and the end we start from. Can you talk a bit about the different ways it appears in each book? So yeah, the theme of motherhood and how it has been okay. a through line in the two books. Oops, sorry, I seem to have opened up the question hugely. I'll put it down. Okay, um, <laughs> motherhood, yes. I mean, I think they, they do show, the two books show two quite different sides of motherhood. Mm -hmm. um, I think very much, I mean, they're two different, stages you could mm -hmm. say as well there are two different points in time but I don't think it's simply a question of that um I think with the first one I was very much talking about this kind of total immersion kind of dreamy kind of and I was very interested in the way that the atmosphere of that early time and then the atmosphere of kind of dystopia and dislocation and just yeah. you know endlessly kind of playing around <laughs> with those, putting those two together um, but it was very much about, you know, the individual bond between the woman and the child and that almost that very, yeah, just that very, very early kind of, you know, how they say that your your brain actually gets formed by that connection. And right. not just thinking about being a mother myself, but also about being a baby, I guess, mm -hmm. and you know, that, be that beginning point of life for us all. Um, <clears throat> and then the harpy is, I think, very much about almost a more kind of sociological <laughs> perspective uh -huh. you want to put it like that about how about motherhood in our society I mean they're both about motherhood and society mm -hmm. but you know really about how mother how mothers are can be in a sense kind of dehumanized mm -hmm. and not allowed to be you know full full people yeah. and there's a kind of institution of motherhood as I should credit Adrian Rich for writing about <laughs> in, um, <laughs> my fav my favorite um motherhood book uh, of woman born which is written uh -huh. by Adrian Rich in the 1970s and she yeah. writes out you know it's not a, it's not about being a mother having children that makes her feel so angry and isolated mm -hmm. and you know deranged <laughs> in some ways and you know um and she talks about you know this yeah the uh, anger and tenderness and this exquisite mm -hmm. suffering and you know all these incredible ways of describing it um it's it's actually um, the context, you know, the, right. the isolation and right. the pressure and the you know, patriarchal structure, right. and, you know. And I suppose I was looking around me and kind of feeling like, well, have thing, how much have things changed since right. Adrian's day? I'm not, you know, I'm not totally sure. So in some ways, obviously, mm -hmm. a lot. Um, yeah. You know, I'm not denying that. But um, in other ways, maybe not so much. And different, and in, and different, very different for different people. You know, mm -hmm. like. Personally, that's, I mean, that's not the way that things have been for me. Things have been a lot more equal at most points. But, you know, there have been times where I've been the one at home. And then right. how does that make you feel, even if that's an agreed position that you're yeah. choosing? Right. <laughs> how does that make you feel in relation to the kind of history of right. the structure or the institution of motherhood? So, that's sorry, that's a bit of a lengthy yeah. reply. But, yeah. No, that, that that touches on so much that I was thinking about with the book and actually leads pretty directly into a different question. Um, one, not the one I initially thought I would ask, um, but that I did think about a lot. So in the, in the book, the Jake, the husband studies bees, right. Um, and I, when I was reading your book, I had a very, I thought a lot about, <laughs> I thought a lot about many high level things, but I also thought a lot about a tweet that I read once um, that went kind of viral. I don't know if you um, have read it, but that I wrote down because I felt like it was a jumping off point. Um, it says, and it came out right around sort of 2017, sort of in the midst of the kind of the Me Too era. It said, every woman I know has been storing anger for years in her body and it's starting to feel like bees are going to pour out of all of our mouths at the same time. And I remember wow. reading that at the time. <laughs> and yeah, and it like really does capture something, both the like kind of bodiliness of anger that you're carrying around with you all the time, the kind of monstrousness of it, mm. um, the cross between sort of being a person and being an animal. But it, it it made me think about in the book, one of the things that seems like it's going on, and I'm curious 
how much um, th this is how you would describe it is that um, Lucy, you know, she has anger because her husband has cheated on her and that mm -hmm. is very justified. But it seems like she also has a kind of massive amount of inchoate anger that has to do with exactly what you're like these other sort of more um, vaguer things. And that's part of the problem in trying to get sort of justice or revenge for the small insult of not that it was small to her, but like for this more contained thing is that there's all this other kind of anger. Um, that can't be quite as easily quantified. Mm -hmm. And so I'm curious about both how you think and maybe how more specifically how you put in the book, how she her how she moves between those two kinds of anger and what it sort of says about her anger and her relationship and sort of the possibility of equity between the mm -hmm. two of them, between Jake and Lucy, because it seems like that's something they both want and yet mm -hmm. really struggle to get that is a long question that is more my thoughts than your <laughs> but, uh, I would love to hear about Lucy's anger and sort of how that yeah. shapes the choices that they both make in the relationship yeah I feel like no I feel like that's such a great reading of it and that's exactly what I intended you know and obviously the kind of premise and the setup of the book and you know is about this affair but I it is very much you know a kind of a catalyst and almost like a sort of symbolic you know, mm -hmm. event that then unleashes the rest of the events of the book. And I think hopefully that's, you know, that's kind of clear in the book as 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 it kind of moves away right. from that, you know, initial kind of discovery and rage and her 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 rage and her 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 sort of and her transformative sense of herself is seems, you know, mm -hmm. less and less kind of entirely tethered to that <laughs> to right. that uh, event. But I think yeah, I think that the, you know, I think the anger is, yeah, it's both at Jake and it's very much not at Jake. And it's very, you know, it's very layered through all the different parts of her own personal history. And then also a kind of, you know, wider. And there's a sense in which there's, I mean, there's a, there's the much wider, you know, situation of her within this, this whole society and the whole world. But there's also this sense of um, generational kind of context about her mother and even her grandmother, and then she right. goes back to talk about her great grandmother and her great right. great grandmother. <laughs> so I believe it's her great great grandmother who has, you know, ten children, one of whom gets left out in the sun. And I, I mean, the, you about that. I'm glad you brought it up. <laughs> most of the book is not autobiographical, but some of the parts about the generational um, right. stories are, yeah. are are autobiographical about my. Um, ancestors mm -hmm. um, and I just find that a really interesting kind of play of right. you know for, in terms of my gen when, when I was born so I was born to very much a feminist you know right. like mm -hmm. uh, Tokyo, um, and then you know her mother very much a kind of 1950s housewife but then her mother yeah. was this kind of suffragette who you know set fire to buildings and left her husband yeah. And, yeah. And, and then her mother uh -huh. um, was much in that total constraint of you know you have to have endless children and right. you know you have so many children that a lot of them die and you know this kind of very very um which you know and in that sense you know how dare I sort of question how much things have changed because obviously right. you know there's incredible enormous change but maybe you know sometimes the fact that things are not things are not as changed as mm. you know she would have come to expect as somebody who was born let's say a similar time to me let's say to I and mean, her mother in the book is not at all the same as my mother but still if you're born generationally at that point there's going to be an expectation of perhaps you know liberation and I right. and and an experience maybe of liberation yeah. as well and then how do how does the experience of, of marriage and of motherhood fit in with that I don't you know I think that's still a very right. something that we're very much still working out actually um mm -hmm. and i think i mean in terms of anger anger and bees and <laughs> it's, it's something i think anger is it's something very i seem to be kind of quite drawn at something in a project i'm working on at the moment is things that are quite actually very difficult to put into language and i think anger mm -hmm. is something that that's very difficult to contain and yeah. you know you were talking about sort of structure and emotion in the novel and i think a lot of the kind of the fun <laughs> and the challenge <laughs> of this book was, you know, how to present somebody at times kind of 
exploding and kind yeah. of completely, you know, or 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 repressing to such an extent, but you know, you're still revealing it's it's in the first person you're revealing what's going on in her in her body, in her mind. And you know, while keep whilst keeping the you know the prose tight and you know yeah. musical and <laughs> yeah. all those other and yeah, and writing it was it was quite draining at times, yeah. you know, because I might have started the book with this kind of dark. It was interesting. You were talking about connecting with a dark um, tone in your work, or you know, and I think I really struggle to connect with it. <laughs> I mean, as in, I I sort of refuse that for for a while as part, you know, as like that's not who I am. Like I'm mm -hmm. a positive, like, you know. Yeah. And then we start from you know, it's often talked about. I mean, it's a dystopia, but it's very hopeful, and it right. you know. Um, I have a sort of religious background, you know, in my mm -hmm. life, and it's kind of like this, this, this you know, internal pressure to be positive and to be, and there is, I think, a lot for, for women and for mothers, and you know, to, to you know, to tell people what's your book about, and you know, yeah. and this is a really interesting process with this book. Say, oh, well, my book's about this, you know, right. sort of gates or whatever, and it's like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, you know, and kind of claiming that, I guess, claiming that darkness, right? Um, yeah, and, so. and it strikes me that when you were talking about how the Emmy Start From is so much about like sort of being a baby sort of enveloped by a mother, right? And being sort of like raised in the mind and experience of someone who came before you. And I feel like the heartbeat talks about how like part of that experience is anger. So even if like the circumstances have changed and you are in a better place than your mom was or and she was in a better place perhaps than her mom was, that that inheritance of it anger of her very justified anger and her frustration and her feeling that maybe motherhood was in addition like that with Andrew and Rich would say a wonderful and like beautiful thing also came with suffering and loss and being mm -hmm. sort of pushed to the side you grow up with that regardless of the kind of circumstances that you may then find yourself in it's part of who you are um I was reading someone telling said recently or I was talking about that they have studies now that like trauma kind of s tends to skip or like be between generations that like a lot of the things that you're working out are the things your grandparents suffered because your parents yeah. have to kind of like shield themselves against it and just be like everything's fine that's over i'm done we're moving forward mm -hmm. and then that you kind of i don't know for whatever reason your grandparents tend to shape that feeling it's like you have to work through the things that they that they lived through um, I don't know how much, I think we have a little bit of time. I can ask you, I feel like every question opens into like 12,000 others, but there was one quote that I really loved from the book that I thought both captured the theme of, or the, some of the themes we've been talking about and also about kind of relationships with readers and writing into the world that I, oh yeah, go ahead. Um, and so I just wanted to read it. It's from early on, not too much farther than when you read, I think it was page 10 of my edition and it's like this. So if anyone ever finds out, meaning what she did, I know what they will conclude. I am an awful person and they, the finder, are a good person, a kind, large-hearted, pleasant person, attractive with a nice smell. This person, this woman perhaps, would never do the things that I have done. She would never even try. I loved that. I A, loved it because of nice smell, which I think is hilarious in the midst of a quite dark, as we've been saying, but, um, but I loved it also because it says a lot, I think, about what we were talking about, how we understand ourselves as good people sort of in relation to other people. So Jake does something bad. He doesn't want to be a bad person. So Lucy has to do something bad so that they're mm. equal again, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I think it also talks about sort of our relationship between reader and writer, right? Like, what do we want mm. when we go to a book? Mm. Do we want to mm. meet someone who is better than us so we can aspire to be like them? Do we want to meet someone that's worse than us so that we can feel better about ourselves? Do we want to read about things we could imagine ourselves doing to feel sort of connected or to read about things we would never do to have catharsis? Mm -hmm. um, and I was wondering if you wanted to just maybe start by talking about how you imagine a reader and a reader on the other end and what mm -hmm. kind of a person and what kind of relationship you feel like you're in 
not to like readers as a whole, we talked a little bit about like public persona, but like just one reader on the other side. Do you spend much time imagining who, say she's a woman, who she is, what she's thinking, how she feels? Um, mm. And is that so different from book to book? Yeah. That's such an interesting question. I mean, I think my media answer, which sounds very strange, I think is that is maybe is that I, I, I am my uh -huh. Reader. I am my reader in a yeah. sense when I'm writing so and I think that that conversation that is suggested by that quote really is between me and myself mm -hmm. in that it, you know it, it it's it's sort of it's a it's a commentary in a way on writing the book yeah um as a mother as well as you know as well as being very much Lucy's kind of statement about herself and her right. shame and her kind of you know difficult kind of reckoning with her own emotions um yeah no i very i think that i it was something that did come to me i suppose with writing um the end we start from and it was different with the harpy but i think that where i i guess i feel most um confident in my writing is where i feel that i'm in that kind of flow of my own intuition and there's mm -hmm. no kind of second, oh, right it's not always it's not always, course, you know there's yeah. no sort of second guessing of like Oh, what would you know? What would so and so mm -hmm. think about this? Or you know, would X right. read like this? Or would what you know? And it's and it's really just so. Uh, that's where yeah, reading obviously you know as as all writers say, reading is kind of maybe you know, like seventy percent of my work as a <laughs> as a writer because so much of it is about training that mm -hmm. response. Um, yeah. I don't know, just read, I don't just read just to train my response to my own work, but you know right. what I mean, like so. Yeah. Um, and you read and you you experience things and certain and it's so thrilling when you read something that you really love and you really yeah. respond to and then to, and then to feel that kind of process happening with one's own work but then you know that's a very kind of that sounds a very insular process but then as soon as the book is out in the world uh -huh. I mean it's such it's such an extraordinarily kind of different thing and it doesn't happen it's not like it's a bit like with having a child it's not like first of all they're completely yours and then uh -huh. they're grown up and they're right. oh, you know married it's yeah. like you know that there's there's a series of stages and there are people very close to me I mean there's obviously my, there's my agent there's my editors and there's yeah. also I have writer friends and we spend a lot of times so I'm sure you do like mm -hmm. exchange work and kind yeah. of talking and sharing and I think that's they I guess if you know they're they're probably my uh -huh. they're, they're my first readers in a practical sense that they read right. it but also perhaps in my head yeah um as well and i but i think that's i think it's a self-judgment point there about yeah and and the smell thing <laughs> i loved it the way you read it out it did sound really funny <laughs> and, um, i love that and i think smell is a big thing in the book you know mm -hmm, because definitely. it kind of signal of revulsion and there's and you know like you were saying about what do people what do people want to find in a book and you know there's that whole question about likability right think, exactly you know, it is a, a really big you know but like yeah like and actually, I haven't had that many people, thank goodness, say to me, Lucy's really unlikable. Or, you know, this whole question about likability, right. I haven't really, haven't really had. Um, and I think maybe we're, maybe we're starting to kind of accept a bit more about, mm -hmm. you know, that that's not really necessarily right. the purpose of reading to just meet right. people you might like to be friends <laughs> with. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, no, I, I, um, I think that's, I think that's, fascinating i mean what who do, who do you kind of think of as being your your reader well you know it's interesting um i love and identify with what you said about it's first and foremost a conversation with yourself and actually how much of the book is in fact structured that way which is the com conversation between like lucy and the harpy or more like a commentary on lucy by the harpy right like there is and there are different aspects of herself but they're in conversation and one part of herself is repulsed actually they feel the same way, seem sort of angry at each other, right? The bad one and the good one, and they have to coexist kind of and have this argument and debate. And I do think that like, for me, there is a deep feeling of privacy in writing when I'm writing well, that I have the freedom finally to sort of talk honestly, kind of among myself, you know, like of the different <laughs> like, parts yeah. that are never quite, um, never quite aligned that never quite seem to fit together. Um, but then also I will often for a story have a kind of second person as a like audience, like a one person that I 
am thinking about. I wouldn't say they're like exactly addressed to, but like often a story will be a will be seeded for me by some kind of interaction, often quite minor, that I can't unhook from, that my brain is just kind of churning over and churning over and churning over. And sometimes it feels like the stories are like arguments with that person where they can't talk back or like a uh, kind of seduction into like, agree with me, you disagreed with me this time, but I'll tell you now, you know, just something where someone has gotten into my head. And usually the story changes so dramatically from the first seed to the end that you would they would never know. And there's not really any evidence of that initial kind of engagement and spark. Mm -hmm. But I can look back and see when I read things I've written, like, oh yeah, that grew out of this conversation with that person and their mind or what they mean for me is very present in the story in some way as a second audience. Mm -hmm. And then you have to have the readers who just read everything right and go, you are brilliant and everything is perfect and you should keep going. And those are my favorite. And then there's some people <laughs> who actually give you honest feedback about what needs to change and what's working and what isn't it. And I do feel like those people, it is really true. They have to love your work. Like they have to want, they have to, there has to be a kind of love there for the idea of the story and the sort of the way that you're approaching it. And then they can tell you every single thing that's wrong with it and like really go dig in and, and fix it and help make it better. Um, mm. yeah, I don't know, that's that's where I am. I Speaking of others, I feel like we're sort of towards the end. We've mm. addressed, I think, all of the questions that came in, but I do want to make sure that I open it up to anyone else who might be feeling shy and having a question um, that, to please, is there, answer about a thing called a dark fairy tale and part oh yeah i missed that that's great yes um are there any fairy tales you read as research or were especially inspired by while writing it yeah please um well i i i've realized recently you know i think what happens a lot with um a little bit like you were saying about encounters and then they get buried and i think that can happen a lot with literary encounters right. as well and um, and even and kind of other cultural encounters like film and music and um, so I had these encounters I actually had like um, so in the UK we have A levels which is when you are like 17 18 so mm -hmm. I don't know but that would be like your high school yeah. diploma or, um, and I had this really cool I think English teacher and so my my A level texts were surfacing by Margaret Atwood uh -huh. at Doll's House by Ibsen or is it Adol's House anyway. Mm -hmm. And then Bloody Chamber, my um, wow, good teacher. job. <laughs> and now I'm a bit like, did this teacher shape my entire conscious? <laughs> I hope you wrote her a note. No, I don't know. I should actually. If you're out there, I actually can't. Yeah. I was in school quite briefly. I can't remember her name. I mean, mm -hmm. my other great, great English teacher was Mr. Durin, who was through my um, sort of first part of my secondary. But anyway. Mm -hmm. um, I think the bloody chamber I'm surfacing actually, but the bloody chamber is obviously fairy tales. And and I had reread it not, you know, since I was 17. So it hadn't just been um all that time. But I think that those fairy tales and that kind of rewriting of a fairy tale and that kind of I mean, what I really love about those is that kind of really, really strong, you know, embodiment um yeah. that she has and that sense of the body. I think that was what I was really you know, captured by um, when I was kind of 17 and just, yeah, that really sensuous, like, I think a lot of the writers, I don't know, that I admired a lot when I was younger, I don't feel that their writing is that similar to mine maybe anymore, or it's a lot, it's a lot, um, there's a lot more, more of it, it's a lot more expansive, it's a lot more kind of long form and like um, Angela Carter, you know, yeah, it's, it's not, you wouldn't call it like, Spare, um, yeah. Right. <laughs> um, but I remember feeling, yeah, this huge sense of kind of identification. Yeah. And, um, but I mean, I mean, your book, and you wrote. I was thinking about this, like, because you wrote your own, you wrote your own fairy tale. <laughs> As did you, yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, it's like very much. I don't know. It feels very much like a completely new and original. Is it the mirror, the thigh bone? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The mirror, the thigh bone. Yeah. Um, I mean, where did that, where did that, did you kind of, how did you get the kind of, how are you, the bravery to kind of just be like, oh, no. um, I don't, you know, it's funny. It's like, I, the thing I always say about that story, which I feel like is embarrassing, but true. So I might as well share it, which is that that is the only story I ever wrote a 
I ever showed to a therapist. Like I was in a really messy part of my life and trying to explain some like big confusing feelings and mm -hmm. that story came to me fair and I was trying to articulate something that I think it's about narcissism and about anger. It was about a bunch of messy feelings and I couldn't express them even to myself. And that mm -hmm. idea came to me very sort of full formed and I wrote it down mm -hmm. and I was like, I don't even know what I'm saying with this bananas thing that I have just written, but it does seem to capture something that I need to talk about for myself and that I can't. And um, I, like my therapist was like, oh, okay, yep, sure. <laughs> um, but uh, so that was a very like, I also almost nothing that I write is very autobiographical. Obviously in some ways, like the more autobiographical feelings there are, the less closely I feel like the actual story can be to my world. And so maybe it was like, I had to go that far to talk mm -hmm. about something that felt so intimate and so personal. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, it's funny, I, I later submitted that story to some magazine, I can't even remember now, and the rejection and it was like a fairy tale themed magazine. It was like a dark fairy tale. And they wrote back and they're like, we're not usually that interested in stories about princesses. And I was like, excuse me, did you read past even the first line? That is so rude. Yeah. But you know, they knew what they wanted and it wasn't that. But I still, yeah. I love, so I do feel like that's where it came to me from like some dream mm -hmm. world. I, I'm like, where did you, a bucket? She's in love with a bucket. <laughs> Like what is happening? <laughs> so, yeah. I, I love that sense of the, the more autobiographical the feeling than the further. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's fascinating because I think a lot of the kind of yeah, questions around the harpy that maybe I was expecting and maybe I, I have had to an extent are mm -hmm. uh, about it's, you know, is it autobiographical? And it's rude. <laughs> yeah, which it's not. But yeah, um, yeah. But, you know, I think that that's yeah I think that I think that in a way I couldn't if this had happened to me exactly could I I don't think you know that would be very and I've been as I we were saying beforehand you know um I've been trying to write a novel recently about something quite mm -hmm. autobiographical and I think it's I think it's a very you know it's people might think that's the easy yeah no <laughs> easy thing to you know to just write about what's happened in your life and yeah. obviously now we have so much you know Auto fiction, but you know mm -hmm. that doesn't necessarily mean that. I don't know that the yeah that that sort of confluence of emotion and event is really, right. you know, what I, yeah that there's yeah. going to be that kind of um, dislocation of that. And I just yeah, it's it's quite a mysterious process. Like I think, I mean, talking about therapy, yeah, <laughs> um, you know, in terms of how that how that happened how yeah how how fiction sorry, this is like massive let's just end with this how fiction happens but you know in terms of the the unconscious um and the conscious writing process right. how yeah how that creation how that kind of story mm -hmm. making i'm just i'm kind of obsessed with it with it without in a sense wanting to look too, too closely. closely exactly yeah, um, I think as a writer i am quite um unconscious in a sense mm -hmm. Intuitive and some of the ways right I hear writers sometimes talking about their work I'm I think oh you know sh should I be more like you know into right. I feel almost sometimes I have to like slightly look away yeah. <laughs> in, yeah. order, in order for things to happen right. and yeah. it somehow has to come from a and I think in terms of fairy tale and myth yeah. and that's really trying that's really drawing on isn't it those kind yeah. of exactly. uh, kind of subterranean yeah um because not just personally but culturally right. of course um and wow. what you know yeah well i think that's a beautiful place to end actually <laughs> and i was just gonna say whatever it is that you're both doing keep doing it <laughs> because you're doing it really really well and if there's a silver lining to this year i think it's just the quality of these conversations you know uh, the fact that you can you can have something intimate. And so thank you for allowing us to just kind of listen in <laughs> on, on this beautiful, really rich conversation. Uh, well, thank you very much. I enjoyed it immensely, um, even more so because I am in the comfort of my own home. So uh, yeah, that was really a highlight. Thank you guys so much. Thank you, Christina. Thank you. Hey, thank you. And remember everyone watching everywhere, 
copy of the harpy. Yeah. Well, and yeah, there we go. Thank you, guys. Well, thank you, and I hope to see you sometime in person in Miami when when all of this is behind I us. Love that. Okay, mm -hmm. stay well. Be well, everybody. Thank you for joining.